Okay. Good evening, everyone. October 7, 2024. Um, select board meeting. And uh, please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, the first thing is on the agenda, citizens input part, and um, I believe uh, we have uh, still have Frank Ovain tonight. How you doing, Frank? Well, yourself? Good, good. <laughs> I have about five minutes, so I put everything down so I could uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. You know, we try to keep the consistency, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, first off, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. And uh, as a quick matter of background, I've uh, been a resident here for 26 years. I live over at Fort Beaver Pond Road in Bellingham, Mass. Um, here to discuss and hopefully change the current process and policy with, uh, with field usage here in town, specifically around the High Street uh, Field Complex which is most of you aware is through softball fields and a concession stand. Providing a quick overview, uh, myself and a few others had approached Next Nine Up, uh, the facility over in, over in Franklin, about uh, establishing a club softball team. We went to them particularly because they've had a lot of success with, uh, with the, the baseball program, uh, namely Hawk Valley Panthers and the, uh, the Franklin Bulldogs. So we thought that there would be a great opportunity uh, since they hadn't had a softball program to, to start one. And after some conversations, they were thrilled about, about trying to create a local uh, softball program, um, you know, to, to satisfy you know, the surrounding towns. You know, after that initial discussion, we realized, well, one, we needed to actually form some teams, and then second, looking for field usage. Um, I had then had a conversation once we put together a, a, a team, a 12U program uh, with the VGSA, which I had formerly been a board member of. And I had said, you know, what do we need to, to do here? We want to work in concert with you. They were thrilled to have us use the fields. We knew that we would, uh, that the uh, VGSA program as well as the high school would take priority. We were going to use, you know, whatever time would be allotted. Um, and, and they were fine with that. Uh, we even had suggested um, that we would like to host a tournament there that wouldn't uh, conflict with any of their tournaments that they host over the summer. Um, the only ask that we had was that they open the concession stand and they could keep 100% of the proceeds. And I'm not sure if any of you are aware, but that can generate well over $1,000 in a weekend, you know, that could be used for scholarships, general maintenance, et cetera. So yet another uh, revenue opportunity. Um, at that point in time, the VGSA president said, you need to speak with, uh, with uh, Mr. Roberts in order to secure a, uh, a field permit. I had uh, reached out to uh, Mr. Roberts and he had said, send me an email with a brief intro about yourself and what you're looking to accomplish. So I had sent that off to him. Um, he had also mentioned during that call, at some point, we're going to need uh, a copy of your insurance binder. Um, a couple of weeks later, I had sent that over to him. And, you know, at that point, um, I hadn't heard back, so I had reached out to to a few other folks, and they had said, um, I think that there may be some concern with um, the conflicts with the BGSA in the high school. So I had sent another email to him with uh, the members of the uh, the board of the BGSA, ensuring him that the high school and the BGSA would take first priority, and the only thing we're looking for is during their, their off times. I had then received kind of early to mid-September a notification that the process had ended, that we weren't going to be um, able to receive a permit because we were technically a uh, for-profit organization, and it's the town's policy to not use uh, facilities um, for for-profit organizations. And I think, uh, taking a step back here, I think that this is a bit of a misnomer because I don't know if anyone is familiar with Next Nine Up, um, but it's one of the only facilities in the area that can, can do indoor softball and baseball. And they've been a great partner with uh, with both the Bellingham basketball, uh, I'm sorry, Bellingham baseball and Bellingham softball. Um, they run winter clinics there. Uh, they are the financial sponsors for everything that you can imagine. Um, signs on the field, discounted rates for, for the use of the facility, et cetera. Um, so I think the term for profit, you know, it's not some nebulous corporation somewhere else. They're, they're neighbors of ours and, and they are quite more of a partner than they are anything else. So I, I want to make sure that the, the, the term partners is really stressed here. The other thing is there are some also some local ties established with Next Nine Up. Uh, Coach TJ Chaponi is affiliated with there. Coach Doug Houston's affiliated there. 
The varsity softball coach, Coach Courtney Cox, uh, Courtney, uh, Courtney Cox, uh, Courtney <laughs> Parker works over there, and Andy Dolan is also affiliated with there. So again, it's it's not like this is far reaching outside of, of the, the town of Bellingham. Mm -hmm. So again, I want that to be uh, you know kept in, in, in the top of mind. The other thing is to kind of put things in a couple of perspectives. Um, I also think it's inaccurate when I was told that the town does not allow the usage of facilities because I don't know if any of you have been to a Bellingham basketball game uh, and there's 5,000 cars in the parking lot because there's a dance competition going on in the auditorium. And I can tell you that by no means are any of those dance schools uh, not for profit. Um, I also know that Jamborees are run over on the turf field for both soccer and lacrosse. Those are all club programs. So I, I think that um, the policy and, and, and the process needs to be taken into consideration here of why is the high street complex so much different than other usage of facilities within the town of Bellingham, especially if we're gonna also be a revenue generator for uh, the BGSA um, to use funds from like a tournament to be put right back into the program. So uh, again, I think uh, those are some things that, that need to be kept into consideration. Um, I also know that when I was part of uh, the, the Bellingham board, if I wanted to use the high school facility, there were two sections of the permit. One was for if I was an Intel program, mm -hmm. there was two sets of pricing. We had to take care of the janitors. If I was another organization, it was another set of pricing, but I still had to take care of the janitors. So once again, I, I think that there is a differential here of why is High Street Complex different than uh, other facilities usage um, you know, here in town. And, you know, the other thing that I wanted uh, to, to make a point of is um, I know that there's an 80% threshold for if you're a, a for-profit of residents. And, you know, one of the things is if you look at the, the makeup of the team, there are three girls from Bellingham. There are two from Blackstone, but they actually have to play for the Bellingham team because Blackstone doesn't offer a program. So they may not be taxpaying residents, but they're, they're fully ingrained in the BGSA. The other players, uh, one's from Hopedale, the other one is from, N the other couple are from Nipmuc. Every one of them participates in our spring, our summer, and our fall BGSA programs and tournaments. So once again, I, I think that there's a bit of a misnomer. You know, we're not pulling kids from New Hampshire and having this mega organization that's, you know, losing money and, you know, we're going to try to block everything up. That's that's not the intent here. Um, and, and again, I, I, I think that we need to keep in mind, these are 11 and 12 year old girls the high street field complexes need to be mowed and maintained no matter what. It's public property. 11 and 12 year old girls are not gonna create wear and tear on dirt and grass to the point where we need to replace the facility every couple of years. So I, again, I think that, that that needs to be kept into perspective. Um, you know, kind of lastly, I've been a resident for the town for 26 years. I've been involved, you know, pretty heavily in the community, whether it was my time on the school committee, which, you know, some of you remember. Um, I, I've been coaching baseball, basketball, and, and now softball, and I was on the BGSA board for, for two terms. I want nothing more than to be a, a friend and respect everything that goes along with, with the fields uh, and the residents here in town. I would never do anything to jeopardize that, and I know that the folks over at Next 9 Up would never want that to happen. So my only ask is we take a look at what the policy is here, and we readdress it and look to how, how can we get 11- and 12-year-old girls out in the softball field as much as they want, rather than burying their face on a TikTok on their phone. So that's that's kind of where I'm at. And I, I, I would hope that all of you would agree with that. Um, thank you very much. Uh, since you looked at it, I'll speak first. Well, I was going to say, anybody else? Yeah, no. Right. And <laughs> one is, thank you very much. Um, I would like nothing more than to see those fields used. Um, this the Bellingham BGSA, that program has dwindled significantly over the years. My Both my daughters played softball for a number of years. And I, I live on Maple Street. I use High Street all the time. It really saddens me to see those, those parking lots empty. The three fields are empty. Um, there's one, the field number one on the right-hand side, I think it's Lowry. Oh, yeah. It looks beautiful. It's green. I know it's sprinkling. I know we're maintaining it. And it really saddens me that I don't even see a playground there. Kids used to go there and swim in the swings, nothing new. So I am absolutely in favor of having a program utilize that field, whatever insurance. But I also want to understand is I, it, it's, it's a town. The, the difference between what you described at the high school, that's managed by the school committee, correct? The softball field, this the softball program, high school uses that field because it's the best alternative, but that actually is a town park. That's the difference between, if you're wondering why it's a town park as opposed to 
the dance contests are in the high school gymnasium, and not the gymnasium, but the auditorium. Yeah, sure. It's different. It is separate. But I am very much in favor of a program utilizing it because it saddens me to see those fields empty. Years ago, I wanted to put a dog park toward the back. We were going to do it. Then a new, a new board came in and flipped, and they, no, 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 don't take our fields away. And every day I drive by there, I never see those fields used except for four or five times a year when there's tournaments. So, and I would love to see the Bellingham Girls Softball Association utilize that concession stand and raise money for their own program. I think it would be fantastic for them to use that if, if that's what you're saying. But I also feel that the, the Next Nine program should pay a fee to the town of Bellingham for the usage, the maintenance, et cetera. And I have no idea what that fee would be, but I do believe that we just shouldn't say, hey, it's yours. Absolutely. We, I think there should be a fee, and I'm sure there are fees paid to Frank. I, I mean, I know nothing about your program. I have boys that have played baseball for years and went through club and did all that stuff. I know what it costs me personally, um, and I know they pay for umpires and field use. But I have no idea what those what we could as a town could pull that money back in, and we could use that for additional maintenance, whatever. So yes. that's that's my two cents. I I think it's a great idea. I don't see it, know of any negative, but that's why we're here. So there's three. You know, if I could just interject, yeah. one, one of the things I had mentioned to the BGSA specifically about the tournament was we would cover all of the cost of the materials. Like they wouldn't pay for the chalk or anything like that. Yeah. All of the parents would volunteer. So there would be zero cost to or time other than the concession stand. And, you know, again, when I was on the board, we give two scholarships to, to girls that, you know, mm -hmm. went through the BGSA up to the high school and then to where they were going to college. If they bring in an extra thousand dollars, you know, whether it's fixing a fence, you know, that's around there or, you know, increasing the level of the scholarship, you know, yeah. these are the things that I, I, I think are worthwhile. And quite honestly, it was never broached about what the we, we would be willing to enter a discussion about. Yeah, I think there should be because there, there's maintenance, et cetera. And, you know, there'll be more maintenance because one is if you're going to use the fields for practice as well as games, it's going to get more use. So I think there would be more maintenance required. Um, we do it anyway, but I'm just thinking outside the box here a little bit. I would think that there would should be some fee paid to the town. I don't know where that money would go, but I would imagine it would somehow go into the parks department because even though people still think we don't we don't have one, we we technically do have a parks department in in, in the town of Bellingham. Yes, um, that's my two cents. Right. It's good, Mr. Well, I I didn't know that much about. The program period because I had no one who played it. Sorry, I had no one who played it, so I uh, was unsure of, of how it all worked. But I, as you explained it, and then as I listened to John, I once again I think he's right. If if we can come to some sort of term as to a fee, and you're going to use it on the off times of our own kids, I don't really see a problem with it. But I think that we also have to involve. Mr. Roberts, who does mm -hmm. a lot of work getting everybody scheduled and all this in the entire town of Bellingham, that man schedules everybody and it's kind of a, a great job, I think. I don't know how he does it, but um, I think that we should be able to work together on this. You know, it, it, it anything for the kids and to keep them busy and occupied is good. So, you know, if we can get that together, I, I, I don't have an issue with it. I really don't. I think it's great. Something like that. I think it's time to reevaluate the procedure that or the policy that we had that got us here and see about what the new opportunities look like, such as you mentioned earlier. Um, I do think it's very similar to how we rent out the auditorium for for other groups that can utilize our our, our properties the best way possible. Yes. So I, I do think it's time for us to take a deeper look at that procedure and policy and see how we can amend it to be more current and more viable for these programs that you so you mentioned. Um, and I did reach out to Dennis about getting those fees and seeing about mm -hmm. what they look like in the surrounding towns, very much similar to what we rented the auditorium for. Mm -hmm. So I think it's doable. It's just a matter of having that conversation and making sure everyone's represented to represent both parties. So I, I'm in favor of what you brought to the table. So thank you. Um, like everyone said, you know, it's um, anything for the kids. Absolutely, I am in favor of it. And um, I think when it comes down to, you know, the, what, like everyone said, it's, um, it might be some cost involved the scheduling, and if those things are lines up, and um, I I don't see no problem too. I think you know it's a maybe you know we'll take that under consideration, and then you know it's um obviously it seems like if we all agree 
as long as if you can make it work with um, the scheduling and then the cost, whatever that might be. And I, I don't see um, I don't see no issue. No, Seems like no, that's the direction we want to go. Right. Unless if Dennis would like to, Dennis would like to add something on it, and it's. <clears throat> No, I I think it's always been our policy on the fields not to allow for profit. But, you know, maybe it's time to reevaluate and look at fees. I mean, girls pay thousands of dollars to be in these programs. I know the deposit just for a trial is five hundred dollars. Maybe we have Bellingham residents play for free. And, you know, it's not just the maintenance of the field. You got to take into account the value of those fields and what the towns put, just like a, the auditorium at the uh, at the high school, it's not just the matter of saying, oh, a couple of custodians to clean it up. The taxpayers of Bellingham paid for those and built those. So there's values associated with that. So that's my only point. I think I think we, we have stayed away from, from rental on our properties. Um, if it's something the board wants to consider, we can certainly take a look at it. So, um, I, 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 no, I, I guess I think we're at a stage where we have to do a little bit of evaluation yeah, on yeah. our end first before we can have any type of decision made. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's opened our eyes and we're not saying no, uh, but we need to look at, you know, maybe look at what other towns do if they if they do this and come up with some ideas. And so, you know, what are the costs? I have no idea what the school can charge, um, charges for the use of the auditorium, you know, all that. I have no idea. So. So uh, we have to look at that. If it's not the case, then Mr. Govain, you know, can we uh, do uh, maybe a little bit more due diligence on our part? We'll uh, take our obviously you know, proposal to uh, consideration. I think it's a great idea. And then, you know, maybe we'll check with the school department uh, as well as with Mr. Roberts. And then um, Dennis will do some research and then and we'll get back to you. And is, is there a way that you can... Um... Is there a schedule that Next Nine Up has already that can, like examples or history that you've already seen in action that we can utilize as a template? So th this is legitimately the first year of the softball program. Okay, okay. So they can, I don't know if uh, they was going to try to get here. Um, it'll probably mimic a lot of what the, the baseball programs do, quite frankly, yep. you know, uh, in terms of field usage. And I mean, it, my only concern was saying like for like because you know like Franklin they have so many teams because of the size of the town yeah. that field usage is, is overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. um, let, let me speak with Dave and I, I can probably get you some information. I'm wondering if that history or that data might help us to figure yeah. out what that might right. be like going forward, and then we can decide on our side what's necessary. Also, number of teams. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As long as you know the works on the both side of the parties. And um, I don't see no harm. I think that's what they agreed upon. As I said, you know, it's obviously it's going to be the maintenance, the fee, um, maybe some kind of compromise for the Bellingham kids. You said that probably, what is it, 50, 60 percent of them for the same month. So there's, there's three of them yeah. right now on an 11 person um, roster. So, yeah. you know, slightly under 30 percent at this point in time. The other yeah. two girls uh, that play in the BGSA, but they live in Blackstone, so yeah. they're not uh, tax paying residents, if you will. So, yeah. Um, one's from Hopedale and then the rest are from Netmark. And, and then, there are days, you know, that we are not using the fields, like Mr. Martinez said, you know, it's instead of the fields staying empty, and yeah. if you can use it somehow, and at the end, it's all about the kids, as long as it works with both sides of it. Mm -hmm. And I think it should be, um, it wouldn't be a bad idea. If you can gather that information while we're doing our due diligence, yes, and then we'll somehow we connect, and then, you know. Well, um, we can put it on the, whenever the, we're ready to yeah. put it on the next yeah. Excuse me, sir. In reference to the number of children and young ladies that you have positioned on each team, yes. You mentioned Blackstone. Uh, the Blackstone organization was absorbed into Bellingham, correct, because of no team availability down there. I'm aware of that. At that point in time, they become, if they're playing for the town's inside system or in-town system, mm -hmm. and asked to play there, they were advised back when they came crossed over the town line that they would have 80 percent of the players since they were only bringing a small staff over 80 percent would be um for a 12-man team would be about eight players on the field or eight players on the bench being quoted as bellingham which would allow them to fulfill their other three players on each team. That's how it was broken down back then. So at that point in time, 
if they're being absorbed into the program of Bellingham, that program is off, more or less authorizing those children to transfer over. That gives you a possible option, but to add and bring in outside towns, that poses a problem of making it, quote unquote, possibly somebody that didn't make the team, how good were they or whatever. I understand it's a uh, club organization, but you still have to say, is this going to be a Bellingham team or a chosen Bellingham team? That's all I'm stating. Okay. Make sure your numbering of your children could utilize the Blackstone organization mm -hmm. combining with the Bellingham organization like it has been for years. And that's how that's been accepted. Okay, take a look yeah. at that, and your numbers just change. Yes, yeah, so it would be five out of the 11 then at that point in time mm -hmm. would be. Uh, and at that point in time, the, once again, we handle on the Parks Department strictly nonprofit because it's the town of Bellingham that we're serving. All right, all our organizations in the baseball fields and the public concern are dealing with a nonprofit group as taxes, all right, as the tax indicator. At that point in time, you look out and say, okay, fine, you're nonprofit. We have other things in town besides just the softball field, baseball field, things of that order. We have other property located in town, which is owned by this town of Bellingham. By doing what you're asking to do and opening up, allowing the town to go profit making. They have to look at the ability to be a campsite. We have property, which is under the Conservation Commission, which you are part of that location you're talking about, this part conservation. Are we going to have them camping there? All right, this is things looking down the line, how these things can be expanded. And we're not going to look that far if you only say, let's ball it up for softball only. The town has to look further down the line. We have other town property that's sitting vacant presently for taxes and conservation items that, unfortunately, if we open it up for, to allow organizations of outside concern use them, we lose our tax base to say, okay, you're bringing them in, but we can't charge them any tax for using it that information or using that partial land, whether it be for camping, work another softball, baseball, like we have in Menden. There's a soccer field over there. Yeah. Yeah. That private organization can come to town and say, we would like to take over your private land, your public land, and put a base couple of baseball diamonds there. And that's what you're also looking at. So this is what the board really has to sit down and consider. Right. It's just so, not great idea. I love it for the idea of the kids, stuff like that. But this is the town of Bellingham, and we have to keep it for usage for the town of Bellingham. We are not working for owning land here and giving it to another organization outside of town so I can pay his electric bill so he can take cash out of the child's mother's and father's pockets to pay his electric bill. I, I think we're getting yeah. way yeah. off track. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm not, yeah. we're not looking to camp there. We're not I'm looking to take money out of people's I'm pockets. And Mr. Roberts, if you don't mind, it's, um, I got to move to, um, yeah. Very good. I got to move to um, agenda here. So if you can gather the information and then we'll do our mm -hmm. due diligence and then we'll connect on the either next meeting or meeting after. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. appreciate it. Okay. Um, I know we got a little uh, carried on with the schedule, and now uh, let's move along. And the next thing is um, on our uh, agenda, historical commission uh, interviews. And um, I believe the first one is um, Mr. Douglas uh, Snoop. Yes. How are you? How you doing? Good. Thanks for your time. Oh, thanks. I know it's been uh, been over a couple of times. 
Um, all right, so let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I know you have the application, um, but uh, just said my name is Douglas Snook. Um, originally from Everett uh, on the North Shore or just north of Boston. Mm -hmm. Um, not too many people know where Everett is, but then again, not too many people know where Bellingham is. <laughs> um, the funny thing about being from Everett is uh, next door is Chelsea, and there is the governor's hunting lodge, the Bellingham Carry Mansion, when Chelsea was the woods, and they have a historic house there, which I've been to. Um, so I've only been in town a little bit over 15 years. Um, you meet somebody from Franklin, and next thing you know, you're living in Bellingham. <laughs> Um, so that's uh, how I came down to be here, um, but I've always been interested in history. I was a history major in college and uh, became a lawyer, so you had to study all the history to go to the law school. It's a good background, especially like English history, where the law comes from, um, but even without that, as I said, I've always been interested in history. Um, we did a uh, family genealogy. I have uh, six brothers and a sister. So we did a uh, genealogy and um, my older brothers were into railroads. And so I got chased all over the North Shore when I was young. They were chasing the old railroad lines for the Boston and Maine because my grandfather had been a conductor for the Boston and Maine. So there's a million pictures of me standing in front of some pile of something that used to be something for the railroad, which uh, of course, we have it down here, which is now the uh, SNET Trail. So, um, yeah, my brothers came down here. They saw that, and I was chasing that railroad line out through Douglas. And oh, they, I was like, I'm not into the railroads. <laughs> but um, I also like to collect things. Uh, my wife would call it hoarding. I say it's collecting. <laughs> but um, so that's always had this interest in history. And I've been interested in the history here in Bellingham. Um, one of the first things my brother bought me when I told him I was moving to Bellingham was the book for the Bicentennial from 1919. Um, so I have that. I've also collected all the postcards. I have a ton of them here that I did bring, uh, just like I did for Everett. Uh, there's a lot more postcards for Everett than Bellingham. Uh, let me tell you that. And that was not done the old way, through flea markets and yard sales and uh, before eBay was even a thought in anybody's mind. Um, but when I did first come here to Bellingham um, and I saw there was a museum, I did uh, go to visit. I think I met uh, Mr. Taft one time and then um, when one of my brothers came and I wanted to go back, he had unfortunately fallen. Um, I forget if he had fallen down the stairs at his home or something, but the museum was closed and it was closed for a long time. Um, my oldest daughter, Emily, when she was in grade school, they had the thing about the history of Bellingham and one of the things was to visit the museum. And at that point, somebody else had kind of taken over and we went uh, to the museum and I spoke to the person who was there. I, I don't mean to speak ill of anybody. I believe it was Marsha Crook. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. And I asked her about the commission. Um, at that time, the um, I'm going to call it the Fairbanks House at the top by Pearl Street was for sale. Mm -hmm. And I spent a lot of time talking with her, or tried to, about did the town have any interest in purchasing, trying to purchase the house, or film it, or videotape it, or put take photographs of it, because I had seen some pictures of the inside, um, and I was told basically to mind my own business. The town had no interest in that, and don't concern yourself, you're not from here, and basically told me to get out of the museum uh, at that point. Um, I asked about joining the commission or anything at that time. She said there was no openings, and it's only for locals. <laughs> um, and so that was the end of that. Um, <laughs> so I had a terrible experience, and I have to say I'm glad to see over the past few years that the museum is open more and, you know, things like that. And like I said, not to speak ill of her, but, you know, that was one of the things. So when I heard there was an opening, I was like, great, uh, let me get involved in the town that way. Um, you know, so and I do have some ideas about, not that I want to run it, <laughs> I'm looking to take it over or be the chairman or anything like that. Um, 
But, you know, some ideas to discuss, and it's just an example, like, say, with the Fairbanks house, when I saw that they had a fire in there, and I, I knew it was done for, I, I knew they would be tearing it down, and they had gone by one day, um, I think it was after the fire, and the front door was removed, and a lot of the windows had been removed and boarded up. And I don't know if you recall, the front door um, had a very early federal period pediment, and, you know, I thought, I tried to contact somebody at the museum. I said they should cut that off. I mean, if the house was going to be torn down, that could have been saved. I know they might not have a place to put it, but it could have been saved till the, perhaps there's a bigger building or something or re-erected somewhere else just to show it as a fine example of an 1800 pediment over a house, but all of that's gone. But again, that was just some an example or did anybody go and photograph it again before it was demolished um i when i saw the pictures of the house for sale there was a huge i think it was four-sided fireplace in the middle of the house center chimney the kitchen had a beehive oven built into it huge huge open hearth all of that should have been photographed and I mean, it's all gone now, and so I see that happening in Bellingham more and more. The history is going. Um, again, just as an example over where the Curtis Apartments were put in, those houses were very early. They should have all been photographed before they were torn down. Again, I'm not looking to run the thing or a, a no knock on the people who are running it now, um, but, you know, again, just some ideas. That is my um, history background. And, um, you know, as I said, I was glad to see somebody uh, from the Bluebird Diner donated some of the signage to the town. You know, the History Commission of Society should be out working with the people as things are changing to either record it or ask for things like that. Um, and also, and again, I'm just throwing out some ideas um, for myself. Like I said, liking history, I don't know if I'm sure everybody's heard of the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. So back in the 1930s, to get people working, one of the things the WPA did is they did a guidebook. And I think they got almost every state, which at that time there was only 48. And there is one for Massachusetts. And uh, of course, they take out old roads going out through from Boston, from Worcester, from Springfield. So the road comes right down. 1A, I think it, at the time it was 1, so if you come down there, they say what's in every single town as you go down. I believe they talk about what's in Bellingham um, as a side note, but they go down through Rentham, Weber Duck Pond. When I first started to come down this way and I would go to Franklin, I came by Weber Duck Pond. Of course, at that time, there was a big sign that said Weber Duck Pond Estates. <laughs> And I was like, gee, where did they get that name? Well, that was because it was the restaurant there and they were known for their ducks and you'd go and order a duck and they'd go get one out of the pond, I guess. Um, I forget what they said about Bellingham. But anyway, it's, it's just to give you a background of my love and interest in history. Um, as I said, my wife says I hoard, I collect, um, and I'm more than happy or willing to share that with the town, with you know, if they were to have a special exhibit, say, at the, um, or, or a rotating exhibit, I know they have some costumes, or not costumes, I'm sorry, but like World War II uniforms and things like that on display, some other household items. I mean, I have a lot of that stuff that I'd be willing to do, again, on a rotating basis if they were having something special. Um, but anyways, that's kind of my background, my interest in history. Uh, just a few ideas, and I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Um, well, thank you very much for your time. Anybody have any questions? I don't. You were very detailed. <laughs> <laughs> I love the enthusiasm. Yeah. No question. And it's nice to have a citizens volunteer um, to help preserve our history or whatever it is in town. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. Like I said, that's a, that was my whole background. Yeah, and, no, and I know the library yeah. does the genealogy. They have some of the room over there. I mean, that's great. And I'm very familiar with Everett, by the way. My <laughs> my son-in-law is from Everett, so, <laughs> so nobody knows. There's a few of us that know Everett, I'm sure. Yeah, when I say North Shore, lots of yeah. people are like, oh, 
top speed. Oh, not that far, no. <laughs> so I usually just no say Boston. Boston, and I'm done with it, and, and that's it. They know where the Bo where Boston is, and that's enough. So, so thank you for your interest. It was uh, interesting to hear all your background. I'd love to see your postcards. <laughs> um, you have the several of them posted up, I see, but there's always those few odd ones. Um, and again, I would you know work with the museum either way, like because I hate to be outbid on eBay, but I always hope that somebody in town is outbidding me and it's going to be in the museum. <laughs> so I don't know if that's fact or not, but that's what I like to think when I lose out on eBay and that's stuff awesome. like that. But. That's awesome. I uh, We really appreciate it for your time. And then um, um, thanks for actually um, volunteering. And uh, what we usually do actually we'll discuss and then um, we'll uh, probably invite your... To an appointment at the next meeting? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. If that's okay with you. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for your time. And um, if I'm not mistaken, the next person is uh, Lauren Hubble. <clears throat> how are you? How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thanks for uh, waiting and uh, staying around. Uh, So I was invited to be here because I applied uh, to be a member of the commission. Mm -hmm. Pleasure to have you. Nice to be here. Anything um, you would like to add? Obviously, we got the application in front of us. Well, I, it's been a while, so I'll be happy to reiterate who I am. Yeah. And that was a wonderful template, by the way, for the background <laughs> information. So um, I've lived in Bellingham for about 30 years. I'm originally from Long Island, New York. Most people know where Long Island is, although they presume it's something that it isn't. But um, my involvement with the Historic Commission really began uh, right smack in the middle of COVID when I did some volunteer work at the museum and became acquainted with the collection and the process. And I can truly appreciate what this gentleman said about yeah. the collection and the spirit and the attitude of some of the predecessors on the commission. And I can tell you after having done some, um, I want to call it decrapification of the museum, <laughs> that one of my favorite things I found in the, in the basement was a sign that Ernie had written and it said, working downstairs, yell, <laughs> because he'd be downstairs in the museum, upstairs someone would come in. And I also found um, some artifacts from other commissioners. Anyway, um, I think what's really important currently is, and I have background in genealogy and research, and I can be very geeky and look up, like, where did these postcards come from? And found out that, for example, a lot of the postcards that have white writing on the bottom came from a gentleman named Nathan Wales, who was a photographer, and his, his um, negatives were found, and there was a sale over in Franklin and somebody bought them and now they're at historic New England. So you can actually find a lot of those postcards available that you can print them out now because they trace down where they came from. And I do appreciate this gentleman talking about um, the importance of not losing track of things, but also finding out where things came from in the first place. And so whether it's a building or whether it's an artifact, and it's been uh, sort of a joy and a um, mystery to me why some items ended up at the museum and why some items have not been put in the museum. And I think that's all important. Um, I do know about the history of the town and read the books and all of that and the original families. But what my experience has been recently is thinking about the Historic Commission and the collection and the mission of the commission. What is our purpose? So my brother and I started doing genealogy. We said, well, why are we doing this? And eventually we wanted to know everybody we were related to and we have some non-biological relatives and who are they and how do they fit. But eventually we came up with a goal, which was we want to find living relatives. And being the research nerd that I am, we found them and we met them and we love them. Okay, so what is our purpose? And our purpose, I think, is how do we connect the history of Bellingham and the original families and the Thayers and the Rhodeses and the Fairbanks with the people who live here now, what's going to make the people who live here now, besides the descendants of those folks, want to come to the museum, want to be involved? And I have um, relatives who are, the children are 
African American, Indian American, Pakistani American, would those children want to come to the museum and look at the collection and find something relevant? They might like the boots from the Burr family. And I think it's wonderful that you now can touch the boots, which I know at one time, one couldn't touch the things in the museum and that's changed. So it's more welcoming to the public to come in. But how do we make the collection and the mission relevant to people who came in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s? So uh, recently there was a volunteer, excuse me, an intern working at the museum this summer her name is Molly, and she was going through all these rosters that had been collected for the schools. So then, you know, where did you live? And when you went to school in the 30s? And were you on, did you attend school every day? Well, that's lovely, but what are we going to do with these things? So I asked her, so when you're going through them, can you find names of people who maybe weren't there in Cook? Can you find anything in these rosters that might be interesting to some of the folks who don't look like me, who might want to come here. So she found different names. There are in these rosters people who took English in the 30s. What were their names? This is interesting. Why were they taking English classes in the 30s in Bellingham? So I think that's interesting. And I think if we look at some of the text, the books, excuse me, you know, there's evidence that there were slaves owned who were these slaves? And is there any relevance to the story of those slaves currently? So I think it's to kind of taking a real step back and saying, what can we do as a historic commission to honor what happened before and the people who came to Bellingham and why ever they came here? And I could be as geeky as the next guy about the Wilcox rakes. I really like all that stuff. But are my grandniece is going to want to come and look at those rakes, maybe for about 30 seconds. But could we look for why did a group of people move to Bellingham in the 70s from Pakistan? What? I don't, I'm making this up. I don't know that that's actually true, although I did a little volunteer work at the, <laughs> the um, fire department. So I know there are some neighborhoods where there are groups of people who came. And how can we connect with those folks, just as much as we connect with the Burr family, about the history of Bellingham maybe in the 70s and the 80s? And then thinking about these folks who took English. What's, that's kind of interesting. And now who's, ta who's taking English classes now from Bellingham? So if I were to be um, on the commission, that, that's sort of my bias. How can we connect the past preservation, which I think is very important, but why do people want to look at this stuff anyway? I like looking at it anyway, but not everybody does. Um, so I think that would be really um, meaningful. And then if there's any way that people can physically get from across the street to over here without having to navigate 85 different crosswalks, because mm -hmm. I know there's a walking program on Wednesday mornings from the senior set, well, seniors tend to go. They might come over to the museum if they could get over here without it, you know, having to, I don't know, take a bus. Yeah. So I do think there's something about reaching out to the senior center and the library and having the connections be not just on a web page, but in person. So one of the things we, um, as a volunteer, what I've discovered is if you say, we're in this meeting right now, if you say, well, the meeting could be on Zoom, but if the meeting's on Zoom, then people don't get to see the collection, they don't come over there, so they're not interested. So the um, some way of connecting to the past, honoring <laughs> Ernie and Marsha Crooks and everyone who was involved, but also what history was not documented. What is that that we don't know? And I may not be the one to ask that question. It may be someone who comes in, but somehow we have to get those folks to be involved. So that's sort of where I'm coming from. But I can geek out as much as the next next guy about the postcard. <laughs> and one of the things I really love to do, when you go to town pizza and they've got the faded ones like you guys have here, mm -hmm. we could print out brand new ones. We totally could do that. It's a matter of literally going on the website and go, ha, ah, now, maybe they like the old faded ones because Charlie's, you know, grandfather brought them over, but um, they exist. So any questions you have for me? I don't. I just, I just want to say, you know, one of the biggest things for all the years I've been involved in town has been the museum. And how do you get the people in this town to understand that that is an open book? 
that you need to go to the museum. I, Ernie fascinated me, fascinated me. I mean, sometimes I went in there and I would say, oh my God, I don't know how you put all this stuff in here. And I never went in the cellar because it scared the living daylights out of me. But he had some of the neatest stuff I had ever seen. Right. And when I became town clerk, putting it up on the walls in here sure. was so very important to right. me. Right. And to the people in this in this building. Sure. So yeah, getting people connected to that is one of the most important things I think that the commission can do because. It's not just the kids. You want to get those adults in this town involved in our history because it's it's it, it's wonderful. I, when I was part of the Blackstone Valley National Corridor, and we worked for two years going through the history of the town in order to <laughs> they didn't like our, they didn't take us, mm -hmm. but it was fascinating. Right, right. So yeah, I would love to see that happen. It would be wonderful. I think it's interesting because those of us who are old enough to know who Kitty Carlisle was, mm -hmm. was television personality, mm -hmm. right? So in some of the collection there, there's a letter from Kitty Carlisle. So we, some of us, would get really excited about that. But other people were like, well, you know, yeah, I know. for 30 yeah. seconds, they might be interested. But I think your point is well taken. How do you get people in the door to connect with the collection, right? And I could tell you 85 stories, but I won't keep you here tonight. But there are interesting things at the museum, and I know the commission has been looking at what in the collection is relevant to Bellingham and what is in the collection that's neat and cool and old, but needs to go somewhere else. Literally, we found a ruler <laughs> from another from another town. So we got in touch with them. I'm like, hey, we have this ruler. Would you like it? Because it has it has nothing to do with Bellingham. It just happened to be in the collection. Right. Because Ernie would go around and buy stuff at yard Everywhere. sales. And they're great and they're cool and you want to touch them. But, you know, is, is some other person going to be interested in looking at that? Yeah. 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 I think it's great. And we'll still Anybody else? No, just thank you. I know that you put a lot of hours over there the last couple of years. So I just want to thank you for all of the time you spent over there. Well, I appreciate it. But I do think it's this two, this two um, points of my involvement. One is being a volunteer in the museum and you know, that's senior tax write-off and you do it anyway. And it's sort of, um, it's like housekeeping, mm -hmm. right? And then I think the differences from a, from a commission standpoint is having it be more, and I don't mean me personally, but the commission setting the goals. So when I'm in the, if I'm doing volunteer work now, we find a random collection of metal. I don't make the executive decision to throw it away we bring it to Rick or we bring it to Bernadette and we go, hey, here's this random collection of metal. And they look at it and they decide based on the commission's point of view, do we keep it? So I think what I'm asking for in this is, I love doing the volunteer work, I continue to do that. But this is more setting the parameters for what does the commission do? And then quite frankly, being a worker bee. So if we say, we think it would be really important to um, educate the public more about what the museum has. So we think it would be really important to make a guidebook. The, the decision of make the guidebook is from the commission. The worker bees over here or the volunteers can maybe type up the guidebook, but the content and the layout and all of that, I think comes from the commission or volunteers come up with a great idea, and then we bring it to Bernadette, we bring it to whomever, and we go, what do you think about this, Rick? Because, you know, it's not to me as a, as a person who's helping organize the basement. All right. And by the way, there's a gentleman, Jack, if you ever meet Jack, who is cataloging the entire basement. Oh, my God. So any God hours that I have spent there, I couldn't be in the basement as many hours as Jack and literally looking at stuff and going, aha, here's this item, and here's that item, and this random collection. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. And then you know, we'll schedule something. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next one is in its um, on the agenda. Uh, Nick Oleri. East Coast. East Coast Renewable Energy Electric, you know, electric Vehicle Charging Station Grant. Bahan, could I just jump in? Uh, Dennis? Yeah, if I could just for a moment. Um, yeah. 
Nick and I, Nick reached out to me some time ago about the uh, <clears throat> stations, and I'm sorry I can't be there tonight, Nick. But um, he's done a lot. He's done a lot of work investigating uh, grant opportunities for us and other communities. That's what his company does, and I think it's a, an opportunity that the town should consider. We we have submitted a preliminary uh, grant submittal, and obviously that's subject to the board's approval, but I think it's it's an opportunity for us, a no-cost opportunity, and also an opportunity to, to earn some revenue as well. <clears throat> and uh, Nick's going to present that. Mm -hmm. Perfect. How are you guys doing today? Good. Good. We're doing good. Thanks for uh, uh, staying uh, a little bit later than probably you were <laughs> anticipating. By no, that's all right. No, I enjoyed it. So thank <laughs> you for having me. Absolutely. Um, before I get started, the state of Massachusetts has this wonderful incentive going on for not only municipalities, colleges, um, for-profit, non-profit entities. Uh, it's installing level three fast charging stations. Mm -hmm. And the incentive is covering basically 100%, uh, but there's all these adders to everything. So my company is uh, covering the, the adders, if you would. Mm -hmm. So you have a complete package to all these charging stations. So putting the charging stations throughout the town, I think Dennis came up with three, three locations, Dennis, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Three locations. So, the DPW, DPW built town common. Uh, Larry was very excited at the opportunity to have a couple of charging stations put there. And obviously it's very accessible. And down on Pulaski Boulevard at the corner of Harpen Street and Route 126, in such a way that we'd actually be able to connect with our SNET trail by walkway. So it's kind of an interesting project that I know Rob Lucy is working on to see if we can't get some grant money to extend the SNET trail to uh, meet up with where the proposed charging stations would go down there. These charging stations will uh, accelerate the uh, renewable energy opportunity that the town of Bellingham has. Mm -hmm. And it's also a wonderful way of generating revenue. So by my, my company donating the difference between what the utility is covering, um, my company's willing to cover. Mm -hmm. We'll install the charging stations. You'll own and operate the charging stations 100% yourself, mm -hmm. meaning you'll receive all the revenue. Um, how I've set it up, with Dennis is my explanation is you charge 50 cents a kilowatt hour. All vehicles can charge. Teslas do need to have their adapter to charge, but all other vehicles can charge. Mm -hmm. um, 50 cents a kilowatt hour. The charging station does take five cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, that doesn't go to me. It's the processing of like credit cards and stuff like that. 24 hour service. If somebody goes to charge and there's a problem, you can call. So you guys keep the difference. Obviously, there are costs that you'll incur, cost of electricity. That's all built in my pro forma, uh, which I can explain to you guys in a second. But the revenue from it is going to be outstanding. So Massachusetts, you have these charging stations. Rhode Island, there's no charging station incentive. So people from Rhode Island will come over and charge. You're going to get a lot of revenue from that because... I have two electric vehicles. I know what it's like to have a level two charger at my house and how long it takes to charge. Mm -hmm. When you're on the road driving around, having a 15 minute charge is a heck of a lot better than a six hour charge. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, this thing, these charging stations will generate money. On average, uh, everything's based upon an average charge. So when your battery's at 50%, mm -hmm. you charge it to about 80%. Yep. For every six people who are charging per day, will generate the town about $10,000. Per year. Per year. Okay. So everything's increments of six. So 12 people charging and an average charge will generate the town about $20,000. So my opinion, the Pulaski Boulevard is probably gonna generate the most because it's on the border of Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. So people will come over. I know myself when I go into other areas, whether it's Connecticut or New York, I'll drive 30 minutes to charge at a fast charger opposed to having them charge at a six hour charger. Is it so like an app that somebody has like no like in the Tesla cars you you can see it all. But is there an app, say you're driving at 495, you don't have a Tesla, oh wow, there's there's one at uh at whatever the address is the DPW in Bellingham. Yes sir. Yeah. It's called PlugShare. 
Oh, sure. So then aside, you go over that. You will, uh, if you guys own and operate yourself, uh, you will have to go on to plug share. You'll enter all the information so that um, people like whoever mm -hmm. can open it up and find it. You want to put it on the, the town website, mm -hmm. Google. So the yeah. more knowledge of it, the better. At the same point in time, it's going to bring people into the town. Yeah. So when they're charging, they're going to experience other things that the town has to offer. Is there a limit to how many charging stations we can have in the town? Um, simple answer is no. Okay. It's obviously based upon what the utility can approve, mm -hmm. based upon capacity, <coughs> and also funds. So, the reason why I ask is, this <clears throat> Pulaski, which sounds great, because it's in South Bellingham, <clears throat> and we have the town common. It, Dennis, is it the DPW, the one on Mechanic Street, or the one on Depot Street? Yeah, Depot, Depot Street. Street. So Deep. that that's odd to me. That one's odd to me. Why it would be there and not maybe something more like in the Stallbrook, in the Stallbrook school property. The Medway line. I'm also the Medway line, closer to 495. Yeah. Just doesn't seem like a, a good place for it. We were trying to we were trying to identify town properties that would make sense. Um, you know, to put it on a school property, I, I don't know how appropriate that would be to have cars coming in and going into the the school uh, property. We really okay. on Hartford Avenue. If and, and certainly uh, we can amend our application and put in additional stations. This is a start. You're yeah. right, limited. But we were we're looking at locations that would have a reasonable amount of passerby traffic. Obviously, the town common uh, since that Bay Bank went out. Mm -hmm. or, yeah. remember, remember, we used to have the lease payment that helped subsidize mm -hmm. the cost of the common. This would help to do that again. We do have an appropriation for the common, but this those funds would help to subsidize that operation. The um, the corner of Harpen and and Route One Twenty Six is perfect. Um, mm -hmm. It would require uh, some contact with the with the school committee. It's nowhere near the, uh, the schools. It's it's right on Route One Twenty Six, but mm -hmm. that property is a part of the major you know Salt Elementary School property so we would have conversation there with, with the uh, school committee as, as well but you know funds raised there could go towards um you, you know obviously it's for a volley fund towards some school uh use but i understand what you're saying we, we were hitting our head against the wall myself yeah. and you're trying to come up with locations that would would have the most passerby traffic that we have control of that we can put parking spaces on so we're still obviously yeah. open and Dan, what about what about the old senior center? The community center. The old community center, because you could pull in there and there's all that land in the back. It is. It's it's just tough though, and it's a tough spot on that corner. Plus, you'd be in somebody's backyard. You know, that there's yeah. whole, both sides of that. I know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. in the back there's okay. not. We don't have to solve it tonight, but yeah, I, yeah I just wanted to, I think it's a great idea. This so just just for clarity. Um, National Grid did reach out to me last week that said that the incentive is 75% filled. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not exactly sure what that truly means. As far I think they've got 75% applications in. So if we do want to add to it at this point in time, we definitely want to put something in sooner than later. Um, <clears throat> doesn't mean that it's going to be totally filled. I imagine they're going to reopen it. But that could affect um, my ability to donate everything. Mm -hmm. depending upon what the new incentive comes in as. Mm -hmm. So if there are other locations that you guys are thinking about, you definitely want to let Dennis know as soon as possible yeah. so I can get everything submitted. Well, I, I Dennis, trust Dennis. Sure. Go ahead. No, excuse me. I trust Dennis yeah. has been his head against the wall yeah. a long time to figure this out. So I mean, it's more I'm listening now, you know, we, because we're going to put that new park, you know, it's in uh, Stalbrook too, you know, it's, uh, I'm assuming, I don't know, just, a, just an idea. Or a charging station? Yeah. yeah. I'm mean, assuming you know, it's just people kind of come and go. You know, it's, uh, I don't know how. I think it might just be a little disruptive to the, to the school? school pool in Miami. Yeah. Depending on where it plays. Yeah, but right. it's a discussion. Okay. It just, you know, yeah. all day long will we'll, be. Uh, yeah, that we'll, would be we'll hard. A little disruptive. Okay. That would be hard. We'll You're discuss right. that later on then. Yeah. We'll take a look at it, do a little more research. Okay. Okay. Are there any actual questions you guys have with the charging station? So I have just one. Please. Um, maintenance. We'll maintain them. So, um, I'm just going to track that answer question a little bit. So with the opportunity, you guys, you guys can open and operate. So you guys will take care of all the maintenance. 
Uh, if I own and operate, I'll do a profit share with you and I take care of all the expenses. In the situation, which I think is better that you guys own and operate, um, and I want to be very clear, I want to own and operate every one of these things, but I want to do the right thing by everybody and I tell everybody what is the better option. The maintenance agreement that uh, my installer offers, um, we donate the first year for you for free. Okay. After that, the you guys can, your DPW can do it. It's fairly simple. Okay. Uh, but my installer does offer a maintenance agreement. So based upon the warranty that is offered by the factory warranty is two years. We donate an extra three years to it. So you have a total of a five-year warranty on the equipment. Um, that covers everything except wear and tear items. So just like a car, right? You buy a brand new car, might have a 100,000 mile warranty, but wear and tear items aren't covered, right? The tires and windows and stuff like that, right? Um, so we give you, you have a total of five year warranty. If you take the maintenance agreement, it's basically a lease at that point in time. You don't have to worry about anything except funneling people over there. You want to make sure that everything's clean and lit up so it's welcoming for people to charge but to answer your question um first year we give you a maintenance agreement for free after that the dpw could take care of it or somebody else can take care of it or you can uh hire the uh install it to cover all the maintenance yeah, same question two yes, questions sir. actually you said install it <clears throat> so basically you hire someone to do it yes sir could you share that who that is and yes. then you know who um who makes these um the charging stations yeah. are made by a company called Alltel. I personally think Alltel is the best. If I was going to own and operate it, mm -hmm. I would tell you to go with Alltel. That's what I would go with Alltel, which is my recommendation to the town. Um, Alltel is deeply rooted in the automotive industry. Alltel is the company that does the diagnostic for your car. When you go to your check engine lights on, you go to the mechanic or the car dealer, they stick that computer underneath. Mm -hmm. That's Alltel Network. So why I like Alltel is for two reasons. Number one, if EV does slow down, they're still going to be there. Mm -hmm. A lot of these other companies, I'm not going to get into them, yeah. but are very one-dimensional. So when EV slow down, they start to slow down too. And their customer support wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Whereas Alltel, if it slows down, they still have their main branch and they can still service everything. Mm -hmm. Um, I've heard a lot of war stories with a lot of other companies that their customer service wasn't great, causing the charging stations to go down. Okay. So all tells the brand, the brand that I would go with. If you guys decide to go with something else, you can go with who, who you'd like. I have no other questions. No, he answered for me. Okay. So I uh, one last thing I was going yeah. to make is that these charging stations are the level three chargers. Okay. Um, they are 120 kW. You will see that Tesla has a couple 150 kWs and mm -hmm. 250 kWs. Those are nice to have, but the batteries that the cars currently have can't support all that charge. So I have a Tesla myself. Once my battery gets to 50%, it throttles down the availability to take a charge. So my battery can take a 250 charge, but once it gets to 50%, it throttles down to one or one thirty, mm -hmm. and once it gets to about one uh, about fifty five, it throttles down under a hundred. So the one twenties are, I think, the the number to go with. Um, a lot of the car dealers are required to put in one eighties, and they're actually acknowledging that we don't need one eighties because the battery technology isn't there. So Alltel is the brand that I support. Mm -hmm. um, if I was owning and operated, I would tell you to go with Alltel. At the same point in time, the 120 kW is the whole donation. If you opt to go with a higher kW, my donation doesn't cover all that because they do accelerate in price. Okay. Dennis, what do we do here next? What what we want to do is have a motion for the grant application uh, for the for the uh, charging stations as proposed in the letter that I had uh, sent. Hillary attached. So um, that, that's all it takes is a vote from the board. Uh, so moved. Second. So we got first, we got second. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 No opposed? Four oh. That's great. Awesome. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. Time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dennis has all my contact information. Yep. If you'd like me to leave anything, I can leave it to you. 
Uh, but feel free to reach out to me at any point in time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Appreciate it for your time. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Dennis. <clears throat> okay. Um, the next one is on the item um, out of business pilot and community host agreement discussion for Bellingham Energy Storage. And I believe um, this is the one um, planning board voted unanimously. No, no, no. No, I'm this sorry. Is something different. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Did okay. I get confused? I didn't. I don't. I didn't give you guys any paperwork on this. Oh, okay. Is it here? No, I didn't this give is, you any. This is the overlay, correct? So this is we're talking about the community host agreement for the battery storage facility. Yep. So oh, okay. Dennis okay. is gonna talk about yeah, that. Okay. Right. Perfect. Right. I, I had sent you know, it to <laughs> Heck, Kate, the, the company came in to talk to us about it. Some of the board yeah. members asked, "Well, yeah. can, can we take a look at the agreement and see what things are in there?" And of course, you can. Ultimately, it's the board's. It's the board's decision as to whether or not we sign off on that. So I did include a copy mm -hmm. with the uh, oh that I sent out on Thursday. So you have oh. that agreement. Um, it, it's it's similar to the agreement that they struck with Medway. So uh, obviously we had a lot of insight. It's the same company, and and they shared those agreements with us. Um, I did bring on obviously Chief Miller and and uh, Chief Fitzgerald to get their input on that. Um, and that's how we crafted the items there. They're, they're different dollar wise. They're, they're similar a little bit more than, than the, uh, Medway agreement, but, uh, um, they're more crafted towards things that we think are important for the town of Bellingham. One thing that the chief wanted to fire chief Miller wanted to put in was a, a, uh, I think it's called a fire resource training officer that they would pay for. Yeah. Um, like 90,000. You're right. So, yeah. which is good. Um, they would pay for for a number of years. Hey, hey Dennis, I, I have a question about that because I read through the agreement earlier today. Does that ninety thousand will that increase year over year with you know inflation or CPI just based on the cost? Of, you know, as you turn people, if you hire somebody and then you turn somebody over, we may have to hire them at a higher rate. So, is there a way to have an increase year over year for that ninety thousand dollars? We and obviously it's a it's a discussion that we can have and if that's we should what what Midway did was theirs is almost like the the fast cops program if you remember where it decreases they pay the full salary the first year and then a little less the next year so just the opposite but we could say that you know as long as that as long as that facility is there we want them to fund the position regardless of the cost that can yeah. be. Our yeah, and you know we could put in a you know like not to exceed a certain amount like three or five percent or CPI which is ever greater. There, there's language we can put in there to make sure that our increase in costs are covered by this company. That's a good idea. Mm. We'll put that in, and obviously, yeah. our our you know our our attorney Rick Holland from KP Law has been very much involved in this as yeah. I have, and um, there's been a lot of back and forth. So we can certainly. Uh, you know, certainly address it that way. Okay. Yeah, I'd like that. Um, and you see some of the other things, some of the walk improvements. Um, you know, I think we have a half million dollars in there for sidewalk improvements in that area. Um, you know, one of the things that we have coming up is we have a tip project proposed for Hartford Avenue from the Walmart all the way to the Medway town line. Sidewalks are going to be done in that area. It may very well be that we want to, you know, maybe earmark that half million dollars for you know, roadway improvements elsewhere or for for I know we keep talking about, you know, park opportunities and things like that, mm -hmm. a little bit more general use. So it can be used for sidewalks or other recreational uses as the select board determines. Yes, Dennis, th yeah. just to remind me on the um, on, on the tip project. Is that set for sidewalks on both sides of 126? As of right now, it is. It could be modified, but yes, it de definitely, okay. yeah. certainly wherever this. I thought it did. I just want to make sure because we absolutely need it on yeah. both sides yeah. of that road. With so, the bike lanes, all right? Yeah, yeah the, the bike, bike lanes will be there yeah. too. So there'll be things and things that'll have to be done. But recall, okay. that project goes through the planning stage. They will have. Yeah. Public right there in that meeting room where the state will come down and our engineers will come down. But that is the plan, much like mm -hmm. the much like the uh, project uh, that we just did on South Main Street from mm -hmm. the, the town center. 
it, it would probably be better for the town of Bellingham to have that five hundred thousand dollars not earmarked specifically for sidewalks, but a general fund that could be used for the betterment of the residents of Bellingham, which could be a park, it could yep. be sidewalks, but it really is for the betterment of the the yeah. residents yeah. of Bellingham. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We, we need to tie it into, uh, and it can be loosely tied into. Uh, mitigation for the project, but we can sure. sure. Okay. Make that. Yeah. I think we should be focused on North Bellingham, honestly, because this is impacting North Bellingham. Yeah, very much but so. Yeah. I don't want to just, you know, not say South Bellingham, but I think in some way where this facility is going to be in North Bellingham, not that there's going to be any negative impact, but if there's a way that whenever that money is decided that we focus on the areas of the north side of town, because there's been a lot of great development in the south side over the years, and there's a lot of feeling that North Bellingham's a little bit forgotten, you know. Mm -hmm. So, a a absolutely, we can um, look at that. And, and you're right. The 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 you know obviously the benefit of this project is it's it's very low, it, yep. it's no impact. Uh, no, very low impact. Okay. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Uh, yeah. We can certainly uh, take that into consideration with the way that we're. Sure. Contract goes. Awesome. So that was that was pretty much it. Uh, the board did ask if, if you could take a look at it. Obviously, mm -hmm. you know, you're yeah. the, you'll be the ones that will be um, assuming that the uh, energy overlay goes through. Then, then you know, this would be coming forward for your consideration. Great. Okay. Good. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Okay, the next one. Yeah, the next one is um. This is the MBTA communities. Yep. Both the Senate article entitled MBT communities overlay district on the fall mm -hmm. town meeting warrant back to the planning board mm -hmm. to one. planning board for review in accordance yeah, we did that, uh, with Mass General Law Chapter Forty Eight Section Five and Planning Board Procedural Rules Section Two Point One. Yeah. Yep, so this is just, yep. um, so these are the two, this is the uh, article that's yep. going on the fall town meeting warrant and part of the zoning uh, zoning procedures that we have to send this article to the planning board for review. Okay. So the motion needs to, um, so you need to move um, to send the energy resource overlay district zoning article for the fall town meeting set for November 20th, 2024, back to the planning board for review in accordance with GL. General Law Chapter 40A, Section 5, and the Planning Board Procedural Rules, Section 2.2. So, so one clarification, yeah, yeah. Or, so I'm looking at other business, and I heard um, I read the, the chair, MBTA, MBTA, MBTA and you read just the read the one above it. Yeah, I'm doing, I just did the energy resource one. I just, yeah, that's what I thought. I just want to make sure that okay. we're clear. Okay, yep. so. Um, I so thought that was, that's why I got confused between the, the what Dennis just mentioned and then that one right there. No, so it's that's two different right. ones. Yeah. Two different ones. Okay. Okay. So this the energy um, resource yes. overlay district is the one that Dennis was just referring to. Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And this is just the MBTA yeah. one. No, we didn't no. do that one next. No, we're okay. gonna do that one next. That's why I asked for clarification. Yeah, yeah. You, you so jumped. Jump. Oh, okay. You jumped one. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. So I just read the motion. So moved. Okay. Second. So we got first. We got second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Perfect. So now the one I just mentioned that about the MBTA. Yeah. <laughs> before I jumped over the first one. That's okay. I can read, I can read the motion. Better. If you want me to. Um, so we need to uh, vote to send the MBTA communities overlay district zoning article for the fall town meeting set for November 20th, 20, 2024, back to the planning board for review in accordance with general law, chapter 40, A, section 5, and the planning board procedural rules, section 2.1. So moved. Second. We got first, we got second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Perfect. Four. No, we haven't missed anything yet. Okay. No. No. <laughs> no. Okay. It went great. Yeah, I know. So the next one is 
I might need a different pair of glasses. This I guess. So the next one. You know, you can pinch it. <laughs> yeah. The thing and make it larger. You know. You know what? That's a great. You know, idea. you can do that. I even glasses. I had to do that. <laughs> I got the paper and I got the hey. iPad. And you have it right next to you too. Come on. <laughs> I have. Come on okay. The next one is. So the next one is um, a, a deed in lieu of foreclosure that was accepted at the Braden Town meeting. And so the board needs to accept um, the deed in order for it to be registered as the um, Norfolk Registry of Deeds. And I gave you guys the motion for that. I don't know if you need me to read it or you uh, have it. Somebody wants to read that? Um, I'll make a motion to accept the deed from the top to States LLC of property located on Pulaski Boulevard, pursuant to the provisions of General Law, Chapter 60, Section 77C. Second. We got first, we got second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. And then I need you to sign the, um, the deed. Yep. Well, we're doing that. Can we go to the next one? Yep. Let's move along. So we got the Tabib Award about by 2025. Here it is. I'll read it. Go right okay, there. I move that the select board authorize the ETW to purchase rock salt for fiscal year 2025 in accordance with bids received in the cooperative bid number PW1169 administered by the town of Freddingham. Second. We got first, we got second. All in favor say aye. 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 Four. Okay. While we're signing that, we'll move to the next one. Contract award led gain testing services for Bellingham Housing through the third. Yeah, that, that is for the community development block program. Um, that's all grant funded. So if, if they did run into a situation where okay. uh, that they were doing work on uh, their property had to have lead paint remediated, then that's the contract they would use. And again, that's all funded through the grant. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I'll move to make a motion to award the lead paint testing services in with con connection with the FY 2022-2023 CDBG grant funded Bellingham Housing Rehabilitation Program to Caulfield Environmental, 243 Legate Hill Road, Lemonster, Massachusetts. Second. We got first, we got second. All in favor say aye. 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 Oh, no. Okay, the next one is um, photo and gift and grants. Chairman. I make a motion that the Board of Selectmen accept the gifts and grants as listed herein with said expenditures to be under the directions of the parties noted. And we have Fund 2706, 51,732 Green Communities, the purpose of De Petro Elementary School and Keogh Memorial Academy LED lighting, and that's by the school department. Um, for 335 is $4,600 MEMA Emergency Management Performance Grant, and that's for the fire department. 6090 is $250, Mrs. Carla Normandon, which is a gift donation for fire prevention account. And 6090 is $200, the Howard family, and that's a donation for a fire prevention account. In a second. Dr. Jen. Okay, we got first, we got second. All in favor say aye. 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 Four. Okay, next one is uh, board on ARPA funds. Mr. Chairman, I move that the Board of Selectmen approve the projects as listed herein with the said expenditures to be under the directions of the parties noted. And that's $68,322.07 ARPA NEU funds, which is the Strawbrook playground and that's by the school department. Perfect. Second? Second, Jen. Okay, we got first, we got second. All in favor say aye. 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 We have another one? Yep. The um this is one where the funds need to go back to North County. County. Okay. And it's just what funds that weren't used in projects that were already um, previously yeah. approved okay. for those amounts and then we can then request them back for other projects. Okay, I got it. Um, okay, Mr. Martinez. 
I move that the Board of Selectmen approve the above listed funds to be returned to Norfolk County. The amount is $7,001.84. It's returned to Norfolk County to reallocate for new ARPA projects. The spending authority is Finance Department. Second. We got first, we got second. All in favor say aye. 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 I'll take it. Four. Next one is a uh, vote on uh, August 19, September 16 minutes. So moved. Here from Jim. Okay, we got first and we got second. All in favor say aye. 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 Four. Yep. And um, the next one is under the new business. Um, actually, old business. Old business. Um, the zoning bylaw review committee. Oh. Dennis, do you want to talk about this or do you want me to? Yes. He's coming. He's trying okay. to get us. I apologize. I was trying to That's get okay. my button off. Um, so essentially, uh, we've got, we, we have two members of the, we have one seat open, citizen at, at large. We have two individuals that are interested in, in being involved. Is a third would be a third member of the planning board. And I, I know that there are legal ways of avoiding conflict. Um, but when you have three members of a five member board sitting on a subcommittee, it can be difficult to avoid issues of, of, uh, deliberation. So I, I think it makes it difficult, um, to, you know, to, to consider, um, putting a third member on there. We have two candidates, we have Jeff Spornavaca, who's interested, and we have Stephen Goyat, who I say is on the, uh, on the planning board. So it's a, you know, certainly a decision for the board, um, we did get an opinion from town council that there would be a way uh, to make sure that, you know, deliberation doesn't happen. It would have to be a very conscious effort to avoid conflict on there. And I, I just think it's something that, you know, it, it's exposure that I don't think you need to have three members of, of one board sitting on a subcommittee like that, that could lead to um, an issue charging a, a violation of the open meeting law. Okay. I, I I agree. I, I agree. I, you know, I mean, both gentlemen are wonderful, but I yeah. I don't think we should have three members of any board sitting on a committee ever. That's a, yeah, that's, I, it's just not shouldn't be. Yeah, I, I agree. So at this point in time, you have Jeff Skornavaka. I don't know if you want to bring him in. I know you've interviewed him in the past, but um, if you do appoint him, that committee will be full and there'll be actually, I'm sorry, Hillary, we were going to bring all the members uh, as far as the names and have the board appoint them all at once. Is that correct? Yeah. Ne next meeting, once we had this discussion. Yeah. Okay. All right. Perfect. If you guys were okay with just appointing Jeff. Anyway, yes. I, I, yeah, no problem. No problem. Yeah. Appointing Jeff. He's, he's, yeah, he's very awesome. knowledgeable. Yeah. And, he, and he would like done there, done there, done, there, yeah. done yeah. that. He's, the, only, the only thing I'll say to this whole process, it was very, very disheartening because um, aside from myself bringing this to Rob, um, Steve actually raised this as well to Rob. He and I had conversations. So he was one of the early people a long time ago when he was going through the change in bylaw and said, do we need to change zoning, et cetera. And he was very much a proponent. And, um, and this was before he was elected to the planning board. And we were talking about getting this started. All right. So, you know, Mr. Goya had, you know, put a lot of effort into a lot of things here, um, into this piece. He and I both sat with Rob quite a bit to talk about it. And and I, I know the other gentleman, I don't know him. I'm sure I've met him. I have nothing against him personally. And I, I understand what, what's disheartening is that members of the planning board showed no interest in this position. And then, I, and I don't know if it was political in nature or what, but then all of a sudden it was, um, you know, and I know Mr. Devine was interested, so I'm not going to say anything. He said, yeah, I'd like to do it. it. It just seemed like it was a way to keep Mr. Goyette off this board. And it's disheartening. I'm just saying it publicly. It's how I felt. It's how I feel. Um, I, you know, I think all the members of this committee are highly qualified. They're very knowledgeable. I have nothing against any of the other planning board members, but, you know, it was, it was really interesting to me that, you know, it was going to be recommended that Steve be, and then out of nowhere, another board member said, hey, I think I'm interested in being in, doing this now. And I just thought it was a bit unfair. It was, it was, it seemed intentional to keep Mr. Goyette off the board. 
and, and that's too bad because he was one of the original members that brought this to Mr. Lucier to say we really need to take a look at the zoning. So that's just my two cents. Um, I'm going to be in, I'm going to, you know, I think I do agree though that having three members of the planning board um, could, could, listen, I've been through this. I, we don't want to, we don't want to have any issues. We really don't. So if we didn't have somebody else that wanted the position, then we'd be okay. They'd have to be, the, the committee would have to be very, very careful. Um, but, but only having two, I think we're, we're, we're in safer waters. We don't need issues down the road. Um, so for that reason, I just wanted to make that public statement. Yeah. Um, nothing against the other gentleman, but um, I think Dennis is right. It could, and I, and I spoke with town council too, and it's not that you can't do it. There's no, there's no reason you can't do it. But there could be potential problems. Well, that's right. And yeah, I want to that's avoid issues. Yeah, and we want to avoid issues. We really do. Yeah, we don't want to have problems nope. at any time. I think that nope. was the joint meeting when we had him, right? Then mm -hmm. we have that joint meeting, the planning board was here. Mm -hmm. And then you know, said so when you I think you know it's no, the joint meeting was the um was sort of the wrong, wasn't it? Yeah. Anyway. Anyway, so um I will okay. make this I will put the um okay. the appointment of all the members and their names to the committee on the next agenda so we can do it. Um, all okay. together. All right. Perfect. Yep. So, what's next? Um, new business. Okay. Jen has to, wanted to bring something up. Okay, I'm not moving. Good. <laughs> Actually, uh, Jen and I had met, and I know Jen's had some interest with trying to resurrect what we used to do uh, closer to the 4th of July as far as our summer event uh, goes. And I suggested she bring it before the board and see if we can't uh, do some advanced planning to. To get that started, so Jen, I'll let you speak to it. Uh, so that's basically it. in a nutshell. We will, um, the town's been very interested in bringing back the 4th of July fireworks since we moved them in 2019. Um, Dennis and I had a conversation saying we'd like to look at what that looks like in the coming year, meet with the, the stakeholders as far as police and fire and get their two cents and see what we can actually do. Um, so I'm, I'm Long before you, you're on our emergency, see if we can talk about that and have that part of our conversation with Dennis. I don't see any problem. I, I some of the conversations I had, a lot of people they were asking why we don't have the fireworks in the Fourth of July. I, I brought it up three years ago, my last year yeah. as a member of the board before, and wanted to bring it back as well. Yeah. I think it's a July Fourth celebration been around for a long time. Yeah. And the board at the time said, oh, but, you know, I, I like separating it. We'd like to have these Bellingham days. I, I love the idea. There's nothing I'm against all, Bellingham days. No, at all. This is just, we moved it for the anniversary year. Yep, temporarily agree. Yep. With all, with all the conscious effort of bringing it back, something unforeseen things have gotten our way, and that just never found its way back to July 4th. So it may be slightly different. It might be very much the same, but, you know, we're going to talk about that and see what it looks like. Um, great. You know, our town definitely wants it back, and we're going to try to find a way to have Certainly it. Certainly, have seen enough of folks on Facebook saying, why yeah. can't we have it on the it, floor? It, it, so it, I think people the town... Events. People, yeah. have, people have, so I think, you know, we discussed in the past, too, you know, yeah. it's a little favor, you know. The, the outcome might be very different. Yeah. It might be July 4th, and we, who knows what it's going to look like. We're going to do the due diligence and see what it looks like. I think the only thing that I remember correctly uh, through the years, both when I sat here and when I was town clerk, was I think the only thing that I remember that was negative was I remember the chief saying it was difficult to get people, the guys, to want to work it. And well, that's, that's, so that's something that we really, really, now we have, you know, new, a new chief new chiefs so, that have yeah. their perspective that can bring it to the table and talk right. about and the challenge. Make sure we we'll have be, our everybody who's willing to be everyone safe, keeping everyone entertained, yeah. celebrating, you know, so and you got yeah, the that's what we like to do. And the other, the other thing I heard is that, you know, when you have it on July 4th, we have, a, we certainly have a larger uh, participation yeah. because we have we have town other towns coming in and yeah. it's more chaotic it requires more coordination but you know what I, I still think it's worth the effort and Bellingham was well known for having the best fireworks yeah. on July 4th it's also about months. being financially responsible right make sure that we can afford it right. Right. so right what that plan is going to be is after we have that sit down and talk about yeah absolutely that. I mean the, the yeah. surrounding towns are still doing to, and, to, uh, yeah. to investigate it and see what yeah, what it's going to be. Our situation to go ahead and that what's that going to stop the subcommittee to do that? Is that what we're talking about? Or? Yeah, that's getting that. Did you shake your head? Yeah. 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 What was the question? I'm sorry. So, so basically, we want to leave here 
to have our, our conversations after but going forward as a committee. Right. So Right, we're going to move forward. I've contacted uh, John Ruggiero, who owns uh, Rhode Island Pyrotechnics, to try and confirm a date um, with them. Fourth of July is on the on a Friday this year, so we're working to um, in anticipation of of the board's support. Uh, I haven't heard. I've spoken with him. He hasn't confirmed yet, but we're working on that. And and I think uh, you know, obviously, the the groups that raise money at this event will be in the past will be placed at the opportunity. So. Um, we'll do the best we can to get it on the fourth. As I say, the fourth is on a Friday. Worst case, yep. put it on the fifth, and which mm -hmm. a lot of communities do. But we'll do the best we can. So our plan is to come back with a more formal. Okay, that's great. So we'll set yeah. the moment then. Yeah. Okay, probably. perfect. That's awesome. That's great. Um, so the next, Dennis. I yes. You again. I have. I'm sorry. I'm sitting out here in the dark on you. But um, I, I just want to let you know that the town administrator search committee is doing a great job and we're actually going to be conducting interviews next week. So we should have recommendations for the board the following week. That's so moving right along the committee and they've done some good work. And I think we've got some some very good candidates to present to you in the next uh, couple of weeks. That's okay. awesome. That's great to hear. Perfect. That is all that I had. That's awesome. Thanks, Dan. All right. Thank you. Okay. May I just? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Mr. Martin. We have our superintendent of schools here this evening. Are we just, um, you're just here to gracious well, with your presence, or was there something you wanted to? It was the ARPA uh, funding for stall. Okay. Was a stall okay, great. Okay. Just in case well, thanks for coming yes. and sitting through it all. You can come anytime, <laughs> you know. You always walk back. Maybe I will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have with us. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, you know, yes, I did. And we all know, you know, you don't have a piece of schedule. You know, Actually, it's very nice <laughs> to have people in the audience. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, is this uh, everything? Yes, everything. That's perfect. So we fulfill our agenda. Make a motion to adjourn. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> okay, we got first, we got second, and then uh, all in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> perfect. Meeting adjourned. Great. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. This is not free. They have a good team.